Good afternoon. I am Robert Brooks. I am a senior park ranger with the city of Newport News. Welcome to today's program. Title of today's program is Contraband Camps on the Virginia Peninsula. Just to give you a little bit back, a little background about uh, Newport News, we have approximately 36 parks located within the city from the north end to the south end of the city. We have Newport News Park, which is our largest park, which is considered the largest municipal park east of the Mississippi River. It's over 7,000 acres, almost 8,000 acres, and we have a variety of activities that everyone can enjoy. There's fishing, there's hiking trails, there's bike trails, there's horse riding trails. We have picnic shelters. We have three golf courses, uh, two regular golf where you hit a ball with a club. And then we also have an 18 hole disc golf course that you play with frisbees. Uh, we also have a beach and we have a campground which is composed of 188 uh, campsites. We have group sites, Boy Scouts, uh, primitive area, and we have a number of parks within our, within our city that offer something for everyone. And if you need some information, you can call uh, our tourism department or you can call our campsite office at 757-888-3333. Uh, today's program is about contraband camps. Contraband camps are almost totally forgotten in terms of why they were established in the United States. And today's program, we're going to talk about the contraband camps that were established in the United States, how they were established, what was the reason, who occupied them, and we're also going to cover some of the camps that are on the Virginia Peninsula. Uh, Newport, in the city of Newport News, some there was one camp that was in the city, but there were several farms within our park system that were camps for families after and during the Civil War. To just give you a little uh, background, in the 1860s, the Virginia Peninsula was scarcely populated. It was mostly composed of small and large farms in Elizabeth City, Warwick, York, and James City counties. Uh, Hampton had a, had, the town of Hampton was fairly large. Uh, there were a lot of houses and a lot of people there, but in Hampton, the tobacco had depleted the soil, so a lot of people in Hampton were farmers and they were watermen. Uh, mainly in Newport News, some of the farms, there were approximately uh, 23 farms that were contraband camps during the war. And the farmers in Newport News used anywhere from four to 40 acres of their land. And they raised corn, oats, wheat, sweet potatoes, and vegetables such as cabbages, peas, beans, melons, and fruits that were for sale in the Northeast New York and other places north, and also in Richmond. And then they had truck farmers as well, where they some of the produce and vegetables that they raised, they sold them locally around the county and in Norfolk. Um, the looming of the Civil War changed the way of life in the area and in the state. With the president, uh, election of Abraham Lincoln as president of the United States, uh, with the new Republican Party. A lot of people thought that President Lincoln was going to dissolve slavery. 
where he said that he wasn't sold. Uh, South Carolina was the first southern state to secede from the Union. Uh, the Deep South states seceded first, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, and some of the states that were, uh, say, north or not in the Deep South were, as they say, Johnny come lately. Virginia seceded from the Union uh, on April 17, 1861 and they joined the Confederate States of America. Uh, with the looming of the war, the Confederacy or their militia and military took Southern installations, Union installations that was in the South. Uh, Fort Monroe, which was in Hampton, right outside of Hampton on Old Point Comfort, remained in Union hands. And because Fort Monroe remained in Union hands, they didn't have enough militia or soldiers to take the fort. So after war was declared in April of, on April 12th, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to join the Union Army to put down the rebellion. After Virginia seceded from the Union, there was no formal policy in the South from the federal government in reference to the status of enslaved persons. You had a number of slaves that ran away from the farms and plantations and ran to Union lines. Some of the commanders gave them back to the slave owner when they came to their lines to claim them and others kept them. So since there was no formal policy. So in April, correction, in, Ma in May 1861, General Benjamin Butler, who was a political appointee, a general from Massachusetts, was sent to Fort Monroe to be the commander of Fort Monroe. General Butler was a basically a political appointee. And he came to Fort Monroe on uh, May 22nd, 1861. On the night of May 23rd, three enslaved men that were leased to the Confederate Army, along with 115 others at Sewell's Point, were erecting uh, batteries and entrenchments for the Army. So on the night of May 23rd, they stole a little small skiff and rode across Hampton Roads to Old Point Comfort, and they went to the fort and asked for asylum. Uh, since General Butler was new there, he met them on the following day on May the 24th. He interviewed them, and this is a photograph or a painting or a depiction of General Butler meeting with the three contraband slaves and members of his staff. Now, the three slaves were owned by Colonel Mallory, who was commander of the 115th Virginia Militia. They were um, James Baker, uh, Frank Baker, James Townsend, and Shepard Mallory. And they told General Butler that they were going, they heard that they were going to be sent south to work on entrenchments and earthworks for the Confederate Army. All of them professed to having family in Hampton and they didn't want to leave. And they even suggested to General Butler, said instead of us working for them, why not allow us to work for you? And then we can get paid for working for you. And General Butler granted their wish and allowed them to stay and told his staff to put them to work with the quartermaster. The following day, a representative of Colonel Mallory came to Fort Monroe and met General Butler at the bridge, and he demanded that the three slaves be returned. He said, I heard that you have three slaves here that belong to Colonel Mallory. I'm his representative, and I came to get them back. And so they had a discussion, and 
Joan Butler asked him, said that he would give them back under one condition. He said if Colonel Mallory came to the fort, signed an oath of allegiance to the Union Army, that he would return the three slaves to him. And uh, Major Carey said that Colonel Mallory wouldn't be coming to the fort. So General Butler said, your request is denied. I consider them, he said, your request is denied because Virginia has seceded from the Union. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 does not apply because Virginia has stated that she is a foreign nation. So the Fugitive Slave Act does not apply. They are property, I'm going to keep them because that property is being used against the Union Army. So he decided that he would keep the slaves. Of course, end of the discussion, Major Carey went back to Hampton General Butler went back from Mill Creek to the fort. So then on the following day, eight additional enslaved persons arrived at the fort. Then the following day, 47 enslaved persons arrived at the fort, including a three-month-old child. So General Butler decided that he needed some guidance from President Lincoln and the War Department. And he wrote several letters to President Lincoln and the Secretary of War asking for guidance. And he told them that they were considered as property, that they were being used against the Union. So what better way to hurt the Confederacy as to take their property from them and then use it against them in that way he could free up soldiers from fatigue duty, um, earthworks, the laundry, cooking, and so forth. And so on, he wrote a letter to General, Lieutenant General Scott, and he said, I have a serious magnitude here because of women, children, and families. And he said, I am in doubt in the utmost doubt about what to do with this species of property. And of course, he received a letter back from uh, the Secretary of War that said, keep them. But in order to do that, I want you to document who their owners were, what work they are doing for us, and if loyal owners come to retrieve them, then we may have to either give them back or compensate them for keeping them. So then a formal policy was established for all Union commanders that they would keep the enslaved people that were coming to the fort. So in, in coming to the fort, they were neither free or enslaved. They were basically considered to be in limbo. They weren't totally free. They weren't totally enslaved. So what the Union Army did was they established a pay scale for them, for the men, women, and children, in a variety of jobs on the fort. They worked in the laundry. They worked for the quartermaster. They were teamsters. They dug earthworks. And after that happened, a lot of the slaves that came to the fort came because the slave owners in the general area left and moved to Richmond and points west away from uh, the Virginia Peninsula. And some of the slaves either hid and didn't go with them or they ran away and came to the fort. And just to describe some of the enslaved people that came to Fort Monroe, uh, W.E. Du Bois said of the enslaved person, they came at night when the flickering campfire shone like vast unsteady stars along the black horizon. Old men and thin, 
with gray and tufted hair, women with frightening eyes, dragging, whippering children, men and girls, stalwart and gaunt, a horde of starving vagabonds, homeless, helpless, and pitiful in their dark distress. That is how W.E. Du Bois described them in his book, Souls of Black, uh, Black Folks. Uh, General Butler decided that he needed someone to be the superintendent of the contrabands, so he appointed Edward Pierce, who was from Massachusetts, to be in charge of the contrabands at Fort Monroe. And Edward Pierce described them as saying, the mysterious telegraph, the, the mysterious spiritual telegraph that runs through the slave population. He exaggerated later on and said and proclaimed an edict of emancipation in the hearing of a single slave on the Potomac, and in a few days it will be known by his brethren in the Gulf. So he's saying that if you tell a slave in Virginia, you could tell one slave what was happening in Virginia. In a couple of days, slaves in New Orleans, Mississippi, and part, other parts of Louisiana would know about it as well. So they started running to the fort. This slide, or this photo here, describes some of them coming to the fort. And these are actual drawings, photographs, or descriptions of them coming. The first one on the left at the top was a painting that was done by Jonathan Eastman Johnson. He observed this family on a stallion around Fredericksburg escaping from the plantation or the farm. You have the husband, the little boy, that's holding by the mane. You have the wife with the baby in her arms, and she's looking to the rear. The little boy is looking down, and the father is looking forward where they're going. In the actual painting, you will see to the left, of, I mean, to the right of the horse, Union soldiers coming in the direction that they are running from. So this is a painting by Eastman, Jonathan Eastman Johnson. There are two copies. One is at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and the other one is in New York in the museum. The one to the far right, family coming into the camp. The bottom right, other families coming into camp. The one on the bottom left, families, generations that are at a contraband camp that was around Cumberland uh, Landing in Virginia. So they came all means, all modes of transportation. You see on horseback, wagon, walking. And just to give you an idea of who they were, um, Charles Wilder testified before the American Freedmen's Commission in 1863, and they asked him, said, who were these contrabands and where were they from? And he said, they were from all about, from Richmond, and 200 miles off of North Carolina. And he stated that there was one gang of 23 that started in Richmond to Fort Monroe and only three made it. And then he said there was another one where a woman came 200 miles dressed in men's clothing. And then he also said that 50 to 60 followed the 5th Cavalry on a raid they had around Yorktown. And he said that they had horses that were taken from the plantation and the farms. And then he said others stole horses along the way. And what they did is the further they came toward Fort Monroe, they would stop at other plantations and farms. 
and exchanged the horses they had for other horses. And then it was asked, why did you come? And some of them said that there were only women left on the plantations in the farm, and the farm, so it was easy for them to leave. And then others said, we heard that you keep and help the colored folks. And they wanted to come to see exactly how it was. And then he asked them, where are your families? And they said, on the plantation and the farm. And some said, I don't have a family, it's just me. So I came on my own. And the ones that had families, he asked, are you going back to get them? And some said, yes, I'm going back to Richmond. And others said, I'm going back for my wife when I earn some money. And another one said, colored men help colored men. They will work along the path and we will get through. That means they were coming back. And there were others that asked, can we borrow some money from you so we can go back and get our families? And one of them said, it's easier to come here because hundreds of black men are working in Williamsburg and they're not getting paid. So what they set up at Fort Monroe, they set up a payment system where if you are an able-bodied person, you got $8 a month. Um, women and boys up to age 18, they got $4 a month. But in the end, they did not actually get the money because they would pay them $2 each month and they would take the other six or the other two and use it for women and children and the infirm that couldn't work. And so that was the testimony of uh, Charles D. Wilder. And he said that in October of 1861, there were over 2,000 contrabands at Fort Monroe. By March of 1862, there were 1,500. By December of 1862, there were over 5,000. So the first contraband camp that we know of was established at Fort Monroe, or which was called then, it became known as Fortress Monroe. And it became a rendezvous place for fugitive slaves, all because General Butler coined the term contraband of war. So he set up the camp at Fort Monroe. And then later, when the Union Army was better organized, and they decided, General McCullum became commander, and they decided that they were going to attack Richmond, and he was going to bring his forces to Fort Monroe. It was too many slaves there, and it was not enough room for the over 100,000 troops that he was bringing with him to attack Richmond. So then General Butler established the second camp called Camp Hamilton in what is now known as Phoebus, but back then it was called Chesapeake City. So they established a camp at Camp Hamilton and sent people sent the slaves to Camp Hamilton along with the soldiers. And then because General John Bankhead Magruder, who was defending building earthworks in Warwick County to defend and stop the Union advance toward Richmond, heard that they were going to use the housing and other quarters in Hampton for the contraband slaves and to house the additional soldiers that came in, he sent troops to, from the area along the Warwick River to Hampton and they burned the city of Hampton so that the quarters there couldn't be used for the contraband slaves and the soldiers. And because of what was happening to them at Fort Monroe, they weren't getting paid, they were being mistreated, 
Um, they were malnourished. They were being whipped and beat. And that is an entirely different story. A lot of them left the fort in Camp Hamilton and went to the ruins of Hampton and established what was called the Grand Contraband Camp, which contained over 7,000 uh, former enslaved persons. And what they did was they took lumber, any lumber that they could find, and they built houses and shacks and shanties against the burned out chimneys that were still there. And so they created their own self-contained contraband camp, and they call that the Grand Contraband Camp that was in Hampton. They set up, set up a camp, set up streets, named streets, and some of the names of the streets are still there today. And the other thing that General Butler decided to do was, I want to take Newport News Point, because Newport News Point, which was back then, Ward County was right at the mouth where the James River exits and enters the Chesapeake Bay or Hampton Roads. So he sent troops to Newport News to establish a camp there. And these are depictions of other contraband that came to Fort Monroe and Newport News. So in Newport News, there was approximately, uh, this was in 1862, there were 656 in former enslaved persons in Newport News. There was 506 in the camp and 150 in a three mile radius. So what General Butler decided to do was he would build an encampment there. And he called it Camp Butler. So that is a picture of them building it. And then he decided also that he would have a stockade there as well. So the 4th Massachusetts were working in Newport News building the camp and then they also built a stockade for any future prisoners that they might capture. So they worked in Newport News, Newport News Point to set up a camp. And in terms of the encampments that were here, there are few known photographs of them that exist. Uh, there are a couple, of, couple from Hampton that shows the camp or the burned out ruins of the city or the town of Hampton. And then there are pictures of shanties that were built. And this is up top is a painting from a photograph that was done by Timothy O'Sullivan, which is downtown or the town of Hampton, and it shows the shanties and homes that the contrabands built to house themselves. And at the bottom, which was um, downtown Newport News from the property was owned by the West family that goes from, from 18th Street all the way down to Newport News Point. So they built the camp there. Now when General McCullen came to uh, Hampton or to Fort Monroe with over 100,000 soldiers, they had to do something with the contraband. So some of them stayed and worked at Fort Monroe, and others were moved. And the top photograph or drawing is the contrabands. They were organized into work gangs. And there's a story from a contraband 
that was in Newport News that was at Camp Butler or Newport News that eventually left Newport News and went to uh, Fort Monroe. And he said that they were organizing the work games. At four o'clock in the morning, there was revelry, or there was a call to report for work. The men came out, they formed up, they had roll call, and they marched to work. And they worked until 6 p.m. daily. And as part of their, their work, of course, they were getting paid four dollars, I mean eight dollars a month. They were getting rations and clothing. And he said uh, the gentleman's name was Edward Whitehurst. And Mr. Whitehurst said that on Sunday, Sunday was a day off, and they were afforded the opportunity to go to church. And then on Sundays, they also received fresh meat. To have with their meal. And the bottom photograph is contrabands in Richmond. So this photo may have been taken on a Sunday on that day off where the family got together and did family activities. Okay, I mentioned that the first contraband camp was started at Fort Monroe, and then, of course, there were ones in Hampton. Eventually, because of General Butler's decision, there were over 220 contraband camps that were scheduled or set up in the United States. So they established over 220 encampments. And this basically shows you where some of the camps were located, camps and farms. You'll see all along the Virginia Peninsula and along the coastline, there were camps established. If you look west, all along the territory of the Mississippi River, there were camps established there as well. In Virginia, there were 42 contraband camps that were set up and or established and there were nine on the Virginia Peninsula. And of the nine camps that were on the Virginia Peninsula, there was Fort Monroe, the Grand Contraband Camp, Newport News, Camp Hamilton, Baxter Farm, which was located near Fort Monroe, where 70 families were that were farming on 3,000 acres of land. They had an overseer there, and they were given weapons to protect themselves. There were two contraband camps in Yorktown. There was Acre Town that was established in 1862, and there was also Sable Town. Sable Town was closest to Yorktown itself, or the Yorktown battlefield. In 1863, General Butler spoke with General Wilde and said, we need to clean up this camp. They tore down all of the shanties that were there, and they built over 500 log cabins for the contraband at uh, Sable Town. So that camp was located near where the Yorktown National Cemetery is. This, the second contraband camp was Acre Town, which, if you look at it today, same as the one at Sable Town, but there were 400 to 500 cabins that were built there in 1862, 1863. And Acre Town today is where the town or the community of Lackey is located. There was also a camp in Williamsburg that was established in 1862 and they say that there were hundreds there. And then the last one was John Tyler, President, ex-president John Tyler's farm in Williamsburg. And basically what they did was in 1862 and 1863, 
there were over 1,500 contraband that were working on more than 50 government farms that were set up in the area. And some of the government farms that were set up in the area included Lee Hall, where today Lee Hall Mansion is located, and there was one at Enview Plantation as well. And when the camp at Newport News was overrun with contrabands from Fort Monroe and Hampton, they packed them up and sent them to Craney Island. So if you're going from Newport News to Suffolk, after you go through the modern Merrimack Bridge Tunnel, that barren piece of land that you see on the left with little or no trees, that's Craney Island. There were over 1,600 contrabands that were at Craney Island. The majority of them were women and children. Some of them were families of soldiers that were employed at Camp Butler and at Fort Monroe. And a lot of the others that were there, they were the aged and infirm that couldn't work. And they had numerous hardships at Craney Island. Uh, the two uh, ladies that worked in the camp were from Massachusetts. The Chase sisters, Lucy and Sarah Chase, and finally, Lucy wrote a letter to General Dix, who had replaced General Butler at Fort Monroe, and basically talked about the conditions of the camp. Little or no food, little or no wood, little or no shelter. And she even stated that Four to six people a day were dying in the camp. And she also said, in terms of children, children suffered as well. She said anywhere from two to five children that were in the camp died. So they closed Craney Island in 1863 and moved the people that were on Craney Island to Norfolk. They established another contraband camp called Princess Anne, and that's where the people from Craney Island went to. Um, in terms of Camp Hamilton and Fort Monroe and the Grand Contraband Camp, there was also a contraband camp that was established in Hayden. And you don't hear too much about that story, how there was a plan to send 5,000 people to Haiti to work on farms and grow cotton for the government. But the, the first trial, they decided that they would only take 500 people. So they went around and got contrabands and free blacks that were in the general area. Some came from Richmond, North Carolina, York County, the Eastern Shore, and they loaded on a ship and went to the island of Il Avachi in Haiti. There were 463 that went, and the government paid the people that established the camp, which was the main one was Bernard Cock, who was a representative of other businessmen. They paid him $50 a person, and he made a lot of promises about what would happen on Il Avachi. But in the end, the promises were not kept. The people rioted, and the president sent a ship back and bought them back. But that is, as a master storyteller would say, that is another story all within itself. So we're going to talk about uh, the camps in, in Newport News are, are the farms. And as the war progressed, things changed. When President Lincoln had called for the 75,000 volunteers, Frederick Douglass and others wanted the Negroes to fight, but they were prohibited from fighting. So the only way that they could use them was to act in concert with the Constitution. So they did the first Confiscation Act, where they confiscated property 
from the southern property owners or people in the Confederacy. And that was in 1861. In 1862, they had the second Confiscation Act that said if you don't surrender yourselves in Union held territory within 60 days, we're going to free all of your slaves in criminal proceedings. And then, of course, later on, they had the Emancipation Proclamation that were the preliminary one was issued in uh, 1862. And then in 1863, on Jan January the 1st, was the President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that supposedly freed all the slaves. But in actuality, it didn't. It basically said that if you're in Southern territory, you're free. If you're in territory that's controlled by the Union Army, and it listed Princess Anne, Hampton, Newport News, uh, West Virginia, and other places, they were not free. So then the government started confiscating the land and farms in southern areas to create farms so that the contrabands could, or the formerly enslaved persons, could take care of themselves and to um, grow property, I mean not property, grow produce and vegetables for the Union Army. So basically the Union Army said, we'll put you on this farm, what we will do is we will offer you protection, shelter, food, clothing, and other services is if you help us. So what the contrabands did, or the former enslaved persons did, was in addition to working as teamsters, spies, cooks, and so forth, they were also guys because the Union soldiers and the Union officers did not know the territory here, so they acted as guides through this area from, say, Fort Monroe all the way to uh, Richmond. But that's another story as well. Now, in, in terms of some of the property in Newport News, um, George West gave an address to pioneers of Newport News in May 1911. And he talked about 23 farms that were in the area that we consider Newport News. And these farms extended from the area where, from the James River all the way across to Hampton. And one of the larger farms in the area was owned by George Bates. And that was over 958 acres. Uh, Mr. Bates' sons served in the Confederate Army and they died during the war. William Smith had over 820 acres. Mr. Smith died and his son served in the Confederate Army. Parker West had 303 acres, but he also had 215 acres closer to Hampton. His property was confiscated, so his property basically, West Avenue in Newport News runs through the property that was owned by the West, and it went all the way down to Newport News Point. So that property was confiscated. William Lee, 215 acres. His prop, pr property was basically taken off, so Mr. Lee died and his two sons served in the army. Edward Parrish had 333 acres of land. Mr. Parrish died during the war. His wife died in York County. Uh, his daughter returned to the property, but when she returned to the property, there were, uh, Mr. West says in his presentation to the pioneers 
that there were Negroes living on the property that had built shanties that came from the other side of the river. So they came from the area which is known as Isle of Wight County. Uh, John Simpson owned 170 acres, and his property was around the area where LaSalle Avenue, from LaSalle Avenue and Victoria Boulevard, extending to down to Newport News. Some of the other property that was taken was Enview Plantation and Lee Hall Mansion. So when the property was confiscated, the Freedmen's Bureau, or the superintendent at that time, would divide the land up and sell it to the contraband. And there was some property that was sold and others that wasn't. They weren't able to sell Inview Plantation or Lee Hall Mansion, but they created a farm and they had seven families living on each piece of property. And of course, as the war continued, there was the Militia Act of 1862 that was established that allowed the freedmen to be inducted in the army to serve with the Union forces. Um, as the war progressed, in 1865, the war ended. But before the war ended, there was the 13th Amendment that freed the slaves. And of course, as the war ended, people came back to claim their property. Uh, in, in terms of Lee Hall Plantation, uh, Lee Hall was confiscated in February of 1864, and there were seven families on the property. When the war ended, Richard Decatur Lee return and file to get his property back. And one of the things that that happened in terms of confiscating property, President Andrew Johnson gave blanket pardons to all the Southerners after the war ended. So they didn't lose their land. Some went to court and sued to get their land back. Others convinced the former enslaved persons to give them the property back and we will allow you to stay because you don't have enough money to fight us in court. So Richard Decatur Lee went to court and filed a suit and he regained his property back in November of 1865. In terms of Enview Plantation, that property was seized by the government as well in 1864. Seven families were on that property. Uh, the Cur Dr. Curtis came back, and Humphrey Curtis signed the oath of allegiance to the Union in November of 1865, and he was able to get his property back as well. And the families that were on a lot of the property were evicted. Now, there in the records, there are... Um, some enslaved persons, there were three, there was a family, and then there were two others that were in Newport News that were contraband. As I mentioned, Edward Whitehurst earlier, him and his wife Emma were on the Ivy Farm property when the camp at Newport News was established. They went to the camp and they worked at the hospital. Prior to the war, Edward had saved over $500. And when that camp was closed, him and his wife, Emma, went to Fort Monroe, and then they left Fort Monroe and moved into the town of Hampton. And as I stated at Newport News, they worked at the hospital where Camp Butler was located. And they were able to buy property that was on Sinclair Farms, which was an area that's around LaSalle Avenue, present day in Hampton. He had 18 acres of land. He had livestock. He had, he had uh, a farm where he raised potatoes, um, fruits, vegetables, and he set up a store with the money 
that he had earned while he was a slave. He had uh, butter, flour, corn, ginger, anything that you could find in a store. He had it. Him and his wife became entrepreneurs in Hampton. But when General McCullen and his troops came back from Richmond, they came to the Whitehurst store with a wagon, and they took everything. They took his livestock. They took his potatoes, took everything out of his store. They didn't compensate him at all. So basically, they lost everything. And then he moved to 18 acres on St. Clair Farm. And then when the war ended, he was evicted from that property on St. Clair Farms as well. There was another contraband by the name of John Banks. And Mr. Banks was on the parish farm. And there are instances where he talked about being on Craney Island and talking about the soldiers impressing the contrabands to join the military service. And the second one was uh, Mr. Whitehurst's half-brother named uh, Mendez. And there are stories about him going to Fort Monroe and working as well as part of the um, work gang that went about from place to place. And then evidently he got caught up in not being paid and so forth. So he left as well. So probably about the only way we can find out about them is through uh, census records. And of course, some of the contrabands joined the military. Um, from the camps at Fort Monroe, Camp Hamilton, and Hampton, they established the 1st and 2nd U.S. Colored Cavalry, and they also established Company B, which was the light artillery unit at Fort Monroe. Um, they established also U.S. Colored Troop units in um, from Craney Island, Norfolk, and Portsmouth. And in, in one instance, they even talk about General Wilde raiding eastern North Carolina to free the slaves. And when they returned from eastern North Carolina, they brought back over 2,500 enslaved persons with them. And these are former contrabands and it shows them when they joined the Union Army. And you can basically see tattered clothing and how they looked after they joined uh, the Army. This is uh, Contraband Jackson, who became a drummer in the 70th U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, this is Gordon, Peter Gordon. And you might see some pictures of him called Whipped Peter. He escaped from Mississippi and joined the Union Army in Louisiana. And this is Private Hubbard Pryor, who was a contraband that joined the 44th U.S. Colored Troops. And there are some U.S. Colored Troops that you can find in this area in some of the cemeteries. There's like John Davis in Hampton. Uh, William Glasgow in Hampton, and then there are two U.S. Colored Troop soldiers that are buried in the cemetery at uh, First Baptist Church, uh, Denby. And of course, we know the story after President Lee, I mean, after Robert E. Lee surrendered, President uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. The Southerners were pardoned, they got their property back. And not all of them got their property back. Two, well, the one in Virginia that was prominent in not getting his property back was Robert E. Lee. And when Robert E. Lee joined the Confederacy, his wife sent a cousin to pay the taxes on the property. And the taxes were less than $100. But because it wasn't paid in person, they refused to take it. And they said, you must come and pay it. 
and she didn't because she was in Richmond. So what happened while she was in Richmond? Of course, there were union officers that wanted Robert E. Lee uh, tried for treason because he refused to join the accept command of the union forces. So they decided to make his property uninhabitable if they claim, came back to claim it. So the Lee property, there was a Freedman village that was established there. Some of the freedmen from Haiti went back to the Freedman village on the Lee property. They also established a cemetery there. So Arlington National Cemetery is on the property that was owned by the Lees. And of course, the Lees went to court and sued to get their property back. The federal government bought the property in 1864 for a little bit less than $27,000. So Lees' descendants filed claims in court to get the property. And in 1870, the U.S. Supreme Court in a five to four, deci five to four decision decided that the Lees were right and they were given their property back. But what was going to happen to all of the mass graves and so forth that were buried on the property? So the federal government paid the Lee descendants the equivalent of $150,000 for the property. Now, the contraband story is a story that hasn't been told as much. It's being told here, or it came to fruition here when Jerry Hollins came back to Hampton and started the Contraband Historical Society in Hampton to tell the contraband story because she was a descendant of contraband. And there were others that were descendants that still live in Hampton today. If you're traveling around in the United States, there are a couple of sites that are administered by the National Park Service that tells the story of the contraband camps. One of the first ones that was established is in Corinth, Mississippi, that tells the story of the contraband. The second camp where the story is being told is Helena, Arkansas. I mean, yeah, Helena, Arkansas, where the contraband story is being told. And then recently, the latest one that was established was Mitchellville in South Carolina, which is on Hilton Head. And of course, contraband gained some publicity in Hampton when citizens in Hampton petitioned uh, pre President Barack Obama to make Fort Monroe a national monument after the fort was closed by the U.S. Army. So the contraband story is being told in Hampton at Fort Monroe. And there were, there are seven contraband churches that are there. In terms of Newport News, what happened to the contrabands? Well, somewhere on Marbury Island, that property was confiscated. There's Fort Eustis or Langley Eustis military installation. In Yorktown, there's a naval weapons station. And in addition to the weapons station, there's Colonial National Historic Park that was established there. So you will still find some of the descendants of the contraband in York County, some in Hampton and some in Newport News. And the church that you see on Gooseley Road near Gooseley and Route 17, uh, Shiloh Baptist Church, was started by an African-American preacher from Pennsylvania, Shiloh Baptist Church. So the contraband story is a story that is out there. More and more of the stories are being told. And in addition to that, there are the stories in terms of the suffering, the hardships, and the mortality rates of the contraband needs to be told as well. So that ends uh, my presentation. Um,
talked about the contraband camps because, as I stated, there were some here in on the Virginia Peninsula, and we have two museums and a park that's associated with it where there were parts of the uh, contraband camps, King Lincoln Park, uh, Christopher Newport Park, and then, of course, Inview Plantation and Lee Hall Mansion. Uh, that concludes the presentation. We will have a second one later this month on black spies during the Civil War. And we will talk about some of those that were here on the Virginia Peninsula in Hampton, Newport News, all the way to Richmond. And we will discuss how they aided the Union Army war effort uh, during the U.S. Civil War. Before we sign off, if anyone would like to ask a question over the comment section in the Facebook Live, feel free to do that. We'll hang on for about another minute in case you would like to type out a question for Ranger Brooks at this time. We'll be creating an event on Facebook for the next Facebook Live, which will be two Saturdays from now at 2 p.m. as well. Um, that'll be the presentation Ranger Brooks was just telling you about. It doesn't look like anybody has any questions. All right, Ranger Books, would you like to sign off? It doesn't look like anybody has any questions. Before I sign off, I would just like to thank, say thank you to everyone that viewed our program and we will be coming back in the future with additional programs uh, on Facebook Live, and we'll also be doing some historical minutes, and we'll be doing um, some interpretive programs as well on Facebook, and we'll be doing some historical minutes that will highlight some of the lesser known parks in the city of Newport News. So on behalf of the director, of Newport News Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, and all the staff of the Parks Division, the Rangers, and everybody that's associated with the park. Thank you very much for viewing our program, and have a great weekend. We actually do have one question that came in. We, did, we got a couple compliments. Um, great lecture, great job, enjoyed, awesome presentation by some of the viewers out there. Um, but we did get one question, and it's that you mentioned that contrabands were paid about $8 a month. How does that salary compare to the white soldiers during the war? Okay, the white soldiers during the war, the enlisted soldiers were paid $13 a, a month. The African-American soldiers were paid $10 a month. Well, they were, they were originally supposed to have been paid 13, but they took $3 from them for uniforms and other recruitment. But the black soldiers refused to accept the pay. So if you read any of the information or books from the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment or watch the movie Glory, there's a scene in glory where the men refuse to accept, refuse to pay, and Colonel Shaw refused to accept the pay as well, but eventually in the end, they were paid the money and they got back pay. Uh, there were instances where uh, Mr. Whitehurst 
went to court and he sued to get his money back for the property and goods that he lost. So there is an account of him filing a claim in 1877 to recover the losses that he suffered to the Union troops during the, uh, when they returned from Richmond back to Fort Monroe and they basically took it. But a lot of the movies sensationalizes the war, but there were hardships that were experienced by all. And the Freedmen's Bureau was established to assist people overcome, to help the people overcome those hardships because there were displaced people all over the South. All right, thank you for answering that question. I don't have any other ones that came along, so. Want me to get you references? Sure, if you'd like to, to close it out, absolutely. Okay, I mentioned uh, some of the references. There were, there are numerous books that were written about it, but one book or a group or a series that was written it's called the Freedmen and Southern Society Project. It was started by the University of Maryland. So some of the accounts about the contraband camps, what happened in them, who some of the people were, the soldiers involved, are listed in that. There's also congressional records that are listed. And if you want to read about Craney Island and that contraband camp, and read of the exploits of the Chase Sisters. There was a book that was written by Henry called Dear Ones at Home, Letters from the Contraband Camp. And the Chase Sisters did an excellent job in documenting everything that happened in the camp and their, um, their letters and journals and so forth are at Assumption University. And then you can also find references in the Atlantic Monthly. And you can find Atlantic Monthly in the archives at uh, Tulane University. And you can also find archives in the Library of Congress as well. And of course, your local library. And go to primary resources. If you look for letters, journals, uh, court records, those are better than books because authors write books to make money, whereas people are writing diaries and journals and letters and so forth of things that happen to them. So they are more apt to tell the truth than things that are sensationalized in a book. No more questions, so we're going to sign on off here, and we hope to see you in a couple weeks at the next presentation. Have a good afternoon.